Today I want to discuss how the strong force is electromagnetic. In most of physics teaching, they'll say that there's four fundamental forces. The electromagnetic force, the weak force, the strong force, and the gravitational force. Well, they'll leave out that the strong force is really the electromagnetic force and it's not a separate force. Um, and that's because a lot of them don't realize this or haven't really studied the physics well enough to understand how the strong forces really work. Now, to begin with, as I've been discussing in a series of videos on weak forces, is the weak interactions are due to quantum fluctuation in interactions. And the strong force is no different in terms of what happens with the proton-neutron exchange within the nucleus. And if you're not familiar, the nucleus contains a bunch of protons and neutrons. And within the protons and neutrons, a proton and neutron can be side by side. And at times, the proton can turn into a neutron and a neutron into a proton by the exchange of particles. Now this theory was first proposed by Yukawa in the 1930s and he won a Nobel Prize for it. And he proposed this as the mechanism for the strong nuclear force. And it was later understood that he thought it was a particle and this particle, once the pion was identified, became, the pion became attached to the strong force and then other other types of particles that were discovered were found to participate in strong force interactions. So we have this idea, but what they didn't realize is what's really going on is particle exchange. Now, eventually, Fermi and Yang realized that you could get nuclear forces by exchanging protons with quantum protons, using quantum fluctuations, proton any proton particle pairs. The proton can be destroyed and a new proton made, a neutron can be destroyed and a new neutron made. And in that way, you can end up with particles being exchanged within the nucleus. It look like they're moving around. Well, it's far simpler to just go back to electron-positron model that I showed here where we have a neutron and a proton. And I've represented the neutron as having a proton and electron inside a shell of quantum fluctuations. And the proton has a proton inside a shell of quantum fluctuations. Now I represent it that way because from scattering experiments we know that there's a shell of quantum fluctuations around the proton at the proton's charge radius. And it's these quantum fluctuations that actually do the scattering because there are many, many thousands of them. And this idea was something that Richard Feynman first proposed and he came up with the term partons for these particles that were doing the scattering. And now we know that these are quantum fluctuations. And when people discuss the structure of the protons, they often leave out the quantum fluctuations that form the spherical shell. But if we consider that, one of the keys to forming protons and for neutron decay is somehow an electron, when it combines with the proton to become a neutron, the electron has to get inside the shell. And the way it does that is with a quantum fluctuation. So basically, proton-neutron exchange is the same mechanism as, proton, as neutron production and neutron decay going on simultaneously, where we have a neutron and we have a positron and electron in a quantum fluctuation. The positron is inside the shell of the neutron and the electron is inside the shell of the proton. And the positron annihilates with the neutron's electron-like component while the electron becomes captured within the proton. And this mechanism allows for 
the electron and positron to look like they've traded traded places. But it's a very simple interaction to make this happen. And then we have, I mean, this leads to the Yukawa screening potentials. Now, part of the Yukawa theory was that this particle exchange interaction interrupts the Coulomb repulsion between the protons, which allows them to be attracted. And this had, was a working theory for a long time, and still is, in terms of how the, this particle exchange stops a Coulomb interaction from working and leads to a strong force also due to the particle exchange. Now, the one thing that most physicists miss because they didn't consider it is there's a Casimir effect going on here as well. Whenever you have a spherical shell that, that scatters particles, including quantum fluctuations, there's going to be Casimir effects. And if you're not familiar with the Casimir effect, that happens in the two-plate example. When two plates are together, they will be pushed together because there'll be fewer quantum fluctuations between the plates because they're too big to fit there than there are outside the plates. And this causes a pressure differential, which causes the plates to be pushed together. There's greater force pushing them together than pushing them apart. Well, this happens between two protons as well. If you look at the interior surfaces, you'll have more pressure pushing them together than pushing them apart when the interior surfaces get close enough. And you can use a proximity force approximation equation, as I've done, and I'll link to a paper where I discuss it, that measures this, fo this force. And it turns out that the Casimir force between two protons has the same range and energy of the strong nuclear force. Now, the paper did not include that there are additional forces on the outer periphery of the protons that are also pushing them together at the same time. So there's an additional component of, to the equations that needs to be worked out, and that's on my to-do list. And if, you, if you're a physicist and you've done research on Casimir effect equations and you know how to do the two-sphere model that includes these forces, then please uh, make a comment or get in touch with me by email. And I'd love, I'd love to talk to you about it. So it turns out that we don't really need the Yukawa screening potentials to account for most of the strong nuclear force. The strong nuclear force is predominantly due to the Casimir effect. And while we think of the Casimir effect as being a weak force, because it's normally weak when we're talking about the two-plate examples, because it varies to the distance of the fourth power, it becomes very strong at very small distances. And so these are the two main components to the strong force, and both of them are electromagnetic. This interaction is a quantum field theory interaction, which is part of electromagnetic theory, and the Casimir effect is part of electromagnetic theory. So the strong force attraction is due to electromagnetic theory. Now, within the strong force, there's also a repulsive component. When two, two protons or a proton and neutron get within about 0.7 femtometers, and that's 10 to the minus 15 meters, closer than that, then they're no longer attracted. There's something else going on that repels them so that they're no longer being attracted to each other. And that prevents two protons or two neutrons from occupying the same space. And this is thought to be related to what they call neutron degeneracy pressure and proton degeneracy pressure. And there's also electron degeneracy pressure. And these degeneracy pressures are important in star formation where certain types of stars, white dwarfs, are limited by the electron 
degeneracy pressure, the point where electrons can't be pushed any closer, while neutron stars are limited by neutron degeneracy pressure. And also, proton degeneracy pressure is, is similar in magnitude and, and range as the neutron degeneracy pressure. So at some point, when these two particles are getting close together, they can't, they can't get any closer. The force pushing them together becomes stronger than the Casimir effect. Now the Casimir effect becomes extremely strong at short distances if, if these, this quantum fluctuation shell has infinitely small quantum fluctuations within it and has a very smooth shell. But if you have a point where the quantum fluctuations are long with respect to the ones between them that are involved in the Casimir effect, then the Casimir effect diminishes. So whenever you have two particle shells like this, at some point the Casimir effect is going to go away because these, the shell is not infinitely smooth, infinitely fine in dimensions. But we also know because the proton and neutron have electromagnetic moment, there this shell is spinning at the speed of light, or all the quantum fluctuations are moving all the way around in a way that it mimics a shell that's rotating at the speed of light. So you have two shells rotating at the speed of light that are trying to bump into each other, and of course they can't. If, if you've ever seen two spinning tops rotating, and they hit each other and bounce off, um, and they interact in a in a magnetic way that prevents them from occupying the same space. In addition to the whole solidity of matter is due to electron degeneracy pressure. So we have the degeneracy pressure between the quantum fluctuations prevents the two neutrons or two protons or a proton and a neutron from occupying the same space. Now, these forces have never been worked out. The actual force responsible for degeneracy pressure and then prevents two neutrons or two protons or a proton and neutron from occupying the same space it has not been worked out and I haven't done it either. It's on my to-do list. But I am convinced that that force too is electromagnetic because we're dealing with quantum fluctuations that are interacting electromagnetically. And so in that respect we can think of the strong force as being entirely electromagnetic, the strong nuclear force. Now I've avoided talking about the strong force within the nucleus, the quark interactions that are supposedly going on under quark theory, because that's all nonsense. And I talk about that in my book, uh, Goodbye Quarks, the Indian Theory, and I have a link to that below. And I talk about these theories in my book, The Zero Point Universe, as well, and you can buy either of those books or my book, The Hundred Greatest Lies in Physics, if you want to study more of this problem. And as I said, I'll link to a couple papers below. And if you buy one of my books, that helps support me in my retirement and allows me to do more videos and do more research. Uh, and I appreciate that. So, if you like this video, please like, share it with your physicist friends, and subscribe to get more of my videos. And I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.